Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, July the 19th, 2020. It is currently 9.15 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, located here in Ovalo, Texas. Now, at 10 a.m., I'm supposed to be live on the air for Sunday School, but I'm sitting here. If I can, oh, here we are. I, I was For a second, I was thinking, uh-oh, I've lost the book. Okay, no, but I have it here. I am sitting here at the church. I got here early, and I'm sitting here, and I'm doing some reading, and you should know what I'm reading, or you have a, you have, you have a, some, you should ha- be able to make a pretty, pretty informed guess, all right? Um, you know that this summer, I've been emphasizing the book of Proverbs, 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 right? So you know there's a very good chance I could be reading Proverbs. And when you also know that this summer I've been telling everyone to read The Imitation of Christ or Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. And I've tried to do some um, devotional messages uh, in regards to this. Now, when the church was back meeting in person, we were working together through the book Imitation of Christ from the pulpit. We took a little detour. If you go to the uh, non-Catholic Catholic podcast, we did a, a lengthy study on mortal and venial sin um, because of something at the end of chapter, uh, the end of chapter one, book one of the Imitation of Christ, where Thomas Kempis talks about how basically sin can destroy uh, the, the grace of God. I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing. Um, and so we we looked at the Catholic teaching about mortal and venial sin. I thought that was super interesting. That's available. You can listen to. But I did see the I don't know how long ago I did a devotional message dealing with chapter two, the beginning of chapter two of the Imitation of Christ. And so this morning I've been sitting here reading chapter two of the Imitation of Christ and wanted to do another little devotional thought on this for this Sunday morning. And hopefully it will benefit you. Again, The Imitation of Christ, the book is available probably free all over the place. You can get it for Kindle for cheap. You should read it. It's considered a classic by people from all kinds of theological backgrounds. I think the book is interesting. But this morning, (laughs) this morning we come to a section that I am strongly, that I am, uh, I'm, I'm strongly struggling with. I'm maybe I'm strongly disagreeing with. I I don't know. So um we're just going to work through it and it'll be interesting to get your feedback because maybe maybe you maybe you maybe you understand what Thomas Kempis Thomas Akempis is saying and maybe I'm the one who's confused. But I maybe because this this subject that he's dealing with really hits close to home with me and the way I think and maybe there, there's the conflict. Now, let's remember this. Thomas Akempis may give us some instructions of what he believes it means to imitate Christ or to follow Christ. Doesn't mean that we believe his instructions are always correct. So the real issue is when he gives us some instructions, when he tells us this is what's required to follow Christ, is he giving us biblical instruction or is he giving us his own instruction? And then if we don't feel it's biblical, then obviously we don't have to follow it. But could there be something to what Thomas Akempis is saying. Those, those are some things that we're going to have to think about, especially in regards to this one. So I've got two, two editions of the Imitation of Christ, two different translations of the Imitation of Christ here. We may uh, reference both of them, but let's go to book one, chapter two. This chapter is called The Humble Conceit of Ourselves. Humble Conceit of Ourselves. You can look for um, a previous episode of the Theology Central podcast where I dealt with... Uh, where uh, I think I entitled it Humble Conceit of Ourselves. Uh, So you can look at that one. This one, uh, this episode is named after something we're going to read in the next paragraph. But let's start with paragraph one. Paragraph one of chapter two of book one of The Imitation of Christ. Here we go. Every man naturally desires to know, but what does knowledge avail without the fear of God? very important. What value is knowledge without the fear of God? Now, I think this is a very critical point here, but it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Look, if I don't fear God, then I can gain all the biblical knowledge in the world. I can know Greek. I can know Hebrew. I can know theology. If I don't fear God, what good is that knowledge? 
All right, now keep that in mind because I think it's better. Better, surely, is a humble laborer who serves God than a proud philosopher who neglecting himself studies the course of the heavens. Whoso knows himself well grows mean in his own conceit and delights not in the praises of men. If I understood all things in the world and had not love, what would that help me in the sight of God? Who will judge me according to my deeds? Now, who will judge me according to my deeds? We spent forever studying that concept when we were, when we, when we were studying the book of Romans chapter 2. Uh, that w- It seemed like that was years ago, but we, we spent <laughs> like six months on Romans chapter 2, verse 6, where we are told that God is going to judge us according to our deeds. And we talked about all the different ways to look at this. But in this par- and paragraph 1, the, f- the big thing that really came out uh, and the, the thing I wanted to really point out, and I'm going to point out again, is what does knowledge avail without the fear of God? I mean, this is the question. This is the statement we should ask ourselves every Sunday before church. What, what good is this knowledge that we're about to obtain, this knowledge we're about to get in studying God's word? To what avail? Of what good? Of what value is it if we don't fear God? Every time we read our Bible, we need to ask our question, what good is this knowledge that I'm about to get from studying the Bible if I don't fear God? What, what good is this sermon going to be if I don't fear God? If we don't fear God, it's just information. It's just knowledge. It's not going to lead to anything. We're not going to be any different. We ha- knowledge has to be. Look, here's the thing. What good is knowledge if we don't fear God? It's just knowledge that will just puff up and make us arrogant. In fact, it won't be any of... Tr- True spiritual knowledge, true spiritual wisdom is only obtained with the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You can get knowledge, but it's just fleshly, earthly knowledge. It's of no avail. To have true spiritual knowledge, true spiritual wisdom, it has to begin with the fear of God. So the question you should ask yourself, are you fearing God? Because if you're not, then the sermon you're about to hear, the seminary course you're about to take, the seminary program you're about to graduate from is of no value. It's a waste of time, right? Now, that's that's a major statement, and that's something that I think we have to really consider. Now, carrying on this idea of knowledge, this is the next paragraph. This is what uh, Thomas Akempis says. And man, I struggle with this. Cease. Whoa, okay, now right there, he wants us to cease from something. He wants us to stop something. What does he want us to stop? He wants us to stop from an inordinate desire of knowing. Cease from an inordinate desire of knowing. Now, as soon as I read that, I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, because my mind just sees the word cease from knowing. Cease from knowing. Are you out of your mind? I... Because I have a hunger to know, a hunger to understand. And he's telling me to cease from knowing. But note, he says, cease from an inordinate desire of knowing. So I grabbed my iPad and I looked up the word inordinate. Inordinate. Unusually or disproportionately large. Excessive. So what Thomas Akempis is telling us is to cease from an unusual or disproportionately large or excessive desire to know. Mm. I'm not a fan of that. Let's pick up the other translation I have here. Rest. So So the other translation says using the word cease. Rest, same idea. Rest, cease from an inordinate desire of knowledge. I don't know how I feel about this because I, I think, I think ignorance, I think ignorance is a, is a horrible thing. We should seek to know. We should desire to know. Not knowing to me is horrible and it's a waste of what God has given us. So, so there's a part of me that is immediately like, okay, Thomas Akempis, this is where you and I, I mean, we, we've already had some other conflicts, but now you and I really have a conflict because if I ha- I mean, think about this, 
and again, I know I'm reading this as cease to know, but just think about it. If I truly cease to know, then why am I even reading the book, The Imitation of Christ? If I cease to know, then why would I read a systematic theology? Why would I read anything? Why would I, I mean, why would I just not be content to just sit and do nothing? But obviously the, 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 the controlling aspect of this is an inordinate desire to know. So he wants to measure that desire, that, it, that, that desire to know is not excessive. It's not too much. But what does too much, what does it look like to have a desire that is too much for knowledge? What, what is he trying to say? Well, let's allow him to try to explain this and see if we can come to some kind of understanding. Oh, wait, let's see. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a desire to know what he's saying. See, I, it just seems so self-contradictory. Here's a book that I'm writing and I want people to cease from knowing, but do you want me to know then what you're saying? Like, I, I, it just seems like a self-contradictory idea, but let's, let's see if he can explain this to us. Cease from an inordinate desire of knowing for therein is found much distraction and deceit. All right, now, he says an, an, an inordinate desire for knowing will produce distraction and deceit. Um, let's see what he um, says here in, 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 this, in this translation of the book. Rest from an inordinate desire of knowledge, for therein is found much distraction and deceit. Okay, they're very similar. They're the same, actually, not even similar. They're the same. All right, so that's not helping. I thought maybe we would get, we would get something here that would offer maybe a different way of stating it. All right, so an inordinate desire to know will bring distraction and deceit. I can understand the distraction maybe. I don't understand the deceit, but I I think I know where he's going here. Let's continue. The learned are well pleased to seem so to others and to be accounted wise. Now, this is interesting. So what he is arguing is that the learned, the one who has this inordinate desire to know, to know, to know, to know, will then want others to recognize it. They'll want to seem wise in the eyes of other people. In other words, they will become preoccupied with how other people perceive them. They are wise. They have this knowledge and they want everyone else to know they're smart. They want everyone else to know. They become preoccupied, can we dare say, distracted distracted with being more concerned with how other people perceive them and how other people see see them. Can we say this? They become distracted and they become deceived and thinking that what matters is how other people perceive them. They become distracted by, by seeking for the praises of men and they become deceived in thinking the praises of men is important. Is that kind of what he is saying? So let's read it all together again. Cease from an inordinate desire of knowing, for therein is found much distraction and deceit. The learned are well pleased to seem so to others and to be accounted wise. There be many things which to know does little or nothing to profit the soul. And he is very unwise whose intent upon anything except those which avail for his salvation Many words do not satisfy the soul, but a good life comforts the mind and a pure conscience gives great confidence towards God. All right. Now, this paragraph is going to require some balance here. We're going to have to have some balance here. Because he's almost making an argument. And again, we have to put the imitation of Christ back in its proper context. So, so many times the Protestant books that, that either review this or use it, they, 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 they seem to fail to understand the imitation of Christ was written by a monk in a monastery. All right. And we have, we cannot, we cannot forget this. All right. Um, in a monastery uh, to your fellow monks, hey, don't seek to know anything. Don't worry about knowing anything if it doesn't avail to your salvation. Now, how do we work this in the real world, right? 
All right, Christians, don't seek to know anything that doesn't relate to your spiritual life and your salvation. Be ignorant about everything else. Now, there have been pockets um, of Christians uh, at different times, different movements within Christianity that really takes this mindset. Um, I can, especially, I, I can't say that this is true of all independent fundamental Baptists, but when I was in the independent fundamental Baptist world, they really played down education and knowledge. It was almost like this blessed ignorance. We don't need to know about this. We don't need to know about that. We don't need to understand this. We don't need to understand that. We just need to know Jesus and him crucified. That's all I need to know. Nothing else matters. And that sounds so good and so spiritual. And then sometimes the ignorance of what they did not know would become very evident. And sadly, even though they sought not to know, they would still speak about things in which they clearly did not know, which is then wait a minute, if you're not seeking to know, then why are you seeking to speak about it? Some Christians really have this mind, I don't, I don't care about knowing this, I don't care about knowing this. So how can we have a balance where we seek to know, but we don't seek to know to such a point that it becomes a distraction and deceives us? Now, the distraction and the deceiving that he points to seems to be our approach to other people. I'm distracted because I want to know And I'm distracted because I want to know because I want other people to know that I know. And I am deceived in thinking that that matters. Is is that the distraction and the deception he's concerned with? I'm going to read it from the other translation to see if they change anything here. I'm going to read the whole paragraph again. Rest from an inordinate, rest from an inordinate desire of knowledge, for therein is found much distraction and deceit. Those who have knowledge desire to appear learned and to be called wise. Many things there are to know which profiteth little or nothing to the soul. And foolish out of measure is he who attendeth upon other things rather than those things which serve his soul's health. Many words satisfy not the soul, but a good life uh, refresheth the mind and a pure conscience give, give, giveth great confidence towards God. All right, so he he's really emphasizing, hey, no, that... I think there's a couple of things that he he seems to, there's really three, I mean, we could really break this down a couple of ways. He seems to break it down this way. The inordinate desire of knowledge leads to three problems. It can can distract, it can deceive, and it will not satisfy. All the words you get, all the knowledge you get, you will not be satisfied. So you can be distracted by it, you can be deceived by it, and you will not be satisfied by it. All right. And that this leads to this distraction and deception leads you to all you care about is appearing wise to everyone else. You become distracted by by wanting to please other people. You become deceived by this. What you should care about, what you should care about is that which benefits your spiritual health, that which helps you grow spiritually. That is what you should be concerned with. That seems to be his emphasis. But how do we balance this out? Does Because I'm telling you, if we approach this, if we really put this into practice, then you're going to have Christians who don't, I mean, why even go to school? Well, you got to get a job. Well, what's the point of getting a job? Like this almost leads you to abandoning the world and joining a monastery. How does these principles translate? And I, and I said that this is one of the key elements of reading the imitation of Christ. How does a book written basically by a monk in a monastery, how do these principles translate to your life and my life? Now, so is there a, so let me ask you this question. Is there a healthy level of knowledge that you should seek to obtain about everything? And is there an inordinate is there an inordinate desire for knowledge that is detrimental and hurtful and harmful? I will say this. The biblical approach seems to be this, and I'm just going to throw some ideas out there, that first and foremost, what it has to be the most important thing to us is our understanding of God 
and our spiritual condition and our spiritual health. That is supposed to be the first and most important thing. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Seek those things. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek those things which are above, seated at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? Uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God. You see that we are constantly supposed to be pursuing that. So when he says an inordinate, an inordinate or an excessive desire to know, does your desire to know other things outweigh your desire to know God and his word? Now, remember, he's already established that, that what what we, if we're going to get the knowledge of God, it has to be, it has to proceed. You have to have the fear of God because if you don't have the fear of God, even knowledge about God doesn't avail anything. It doesn't accomplish anything. But I think that there's, there's the really, the, the, that's where we really draw the dividing line in the sand, right? That's where we draw the line in the sand. Here's the issue. Any desire to know that supersedes your desire to know God, Christ, and him crucified to grow in the grace and knowledge of God, your desire to know and grow spiritually. Any desire that exceeds that, any desire that supersedes that other desire is by definition an inordinate desire and is ungodly. Now, this, 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 should, make, this should convict a lot of people because a lot of people want to know all kinds of things. They may want to know things to advance in their career. They may want to know things because they're curious. They, and, and I, and a lot of people think, now I'll make this very clear because, because, uh, because I know how some people are going to handle this. Well, see, they're going to sit back and pat themselves on the back thinking they're all spiritual going, Hey, you people who go read books all the time and you want to, you want to go to school and you want to learn and you want to learn and you want to learn. You, you have an inordinate desire to know, but let me make this very clear. You can have an inordinate desire to know things that may be that may, that, uh, things that are important, and you can have an inordinate desire to know things that are not important. It's not about what you're desiring to know. It's about the in, inordinate and excessive desire to know it more than you want to know the things of God. So let me say, if you sp- let me say it this way: if you spend hours on social media. You can say, well, I'm not really desiring to know, but you're spending hours trying, learning, knowing, seeing what other people are saying. You're spending all your time knowing and seeing what other people are saying about this and about that, what they had for supper, pictures of their grandkids, uh, funny memes, videos, whatever you want. All the time you spend looking at that phone, all right, I'm holding a book in my hand pretending it's a phone, sitting there tapping on your phone, tap, 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 hour after hour after hour after hour after hour. Is that not an inordinate desire to know that which is vanity and meaninglessness? Now, if I spend all day with an inordinate desire to know what's in a book or to know what's happening in the world, that that could be that could be toward, directed towards me. In other words, this could this can this applies to everyone. The issue is, what do you desire most to know the things of God, to know those things that avail to your salvation, that avail to your spiritual health, that will help you grow, or do you desire to know everything else? Any. Inordinate, excessive, right? Any excessive desire. Or or let me state it this way. Any desire that is greater than your desire to know God, to grow spiritually, is an inordinate desire that we must cease from and that we must rest from. That is convicting. You can have a desire to be popular. You can have a desire to gain followers on social media. You can have desires to gain listeners to a podcast or a YouTube channel. You can have a desire to 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 move forward in your job or to get promoted. You can have desire to get a degree in school. You can have all of these desires if those desires exceed your desire to grow in the knowledge of God then that's an inordinate desire 
and I think biblically we are in a, we we are we we would be in a position where we would stand condemned. But I don't know if anyone ever really thinks this through. I mean, I, he, Thomas Akempis is raising a very challenging position. What do we desire most? So let me read this one more time. I'm going to have to stop. This is a, there's a really interesting section here. Let me read this to you again. All right. I'm going to read it in this translation, I think. All right, here we go. Rest. In fact, I'm going to read, well, no, uh, I'm going to read this whole thing from, I'm going to read uh, paragraph one and paragraph two. There is naturally in every man a desire to know, but what profit, but what profiteth knowledge without the fear of God? Now, again, that's the question. What good is knowledge without the fear of God? You ha- your knowledge has to have the fear of God or it's no knowledge, all right? So and that's just, man, that's such a powerful statement. Better of a surety is a lowly peasant who serveth God than a proud philosopher who watcheth the stars and neglecteth the knowledge of himself. He who knoweth himself well is vile in his own sight, neither regardeth he the praises of men. If I knew all the things that are in the world and were not in charity, what should it help me before God who is to judge me according to my deeds? Now, here's the paragraph for today's devotional. Rest from inordinate desire of knowledge, for therein is found much distraction and deceit. Those who have knowledge desire to appear learned and to be called wise. Many things there are to know which profit little or nothing to the soul. And foolish out of measure is he who attendeth upon other things rather than those which serve to his soul's health. Many words satisfy not the soul, but a good life refresheth the mind and a pure conscience giveth great confidence towards God. What do you desire to know? What are you knowing? How have you become distracted and deceived? Do you desire to know that which will avail, that which will uh, help you spiritually? Is there your greatest knowledge to know that? All right, I'll stop right there. You can contact me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll be back on the air at 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. or 10 p.m. Yeah, at 10 p.m. I'm taking a long break at 10 a.m., which is in about 15 minutes. And I think we'll be under the VBC Bible Institute. We'll be in Genesis chapter four. So tune in live. Have a great morning. Um, May God bless you.